In the annals of video game history sit certain titles that shook the world, that defined genres and that influenced developers. Games like Space Invaders, SimCity, Super Mario Bros, Doom and so many more. And I would include in that list, Lemmings. Hello Cave Dwellers, this is my signed copy by one of the developers, Mike Daly, which takes pride of place here at the cave. Lemons, of course, certainly wasn't the first puzzle game to grace our screens when it appeared in 1991 on the Commodore Amiga. But it did offer the perfect balance of challenge and jeopardy. You were just compelled to keep those little guys alive, or until at least they frustrated you enough to reach for the nuke button and blow them all up. It was one of those games that come around once in a while that everybody just seemed to be hooked on. From its origins on that Commodore Amiga, it was ported to nearly every computer and console going, delighting an audience that spanned continents as well as platforms, and selling an estimated 20 million copies. And that's just the first game many sequels followed adding to that sales tally. So unsurprisingly, it's remembered extremely fondly by many today. And it wasn't just the micros that we found this game on. It spread from the Amiga all the way to the Panasonic 3DO. Absolutely nothing could stop these lemmings. Not even 8-bit machines, such as the Amstrad CPC. That got a version here. Because where there's demand, developers will find a way. And my goodness, there was demand for lemmings. It was on the Sinclair ZX Spectrum, which somehow makes the game completely playable using a single colour in the main play area. And it reached handhelds such as the Atari Lynx, adapting the original mouse-driven interface to work with a tiny screen and a D-pad. The Sega Mega Drive got lemmings, the Nintendo Entertainment System and the Super Nintendo, they all got lemmings. Even the Sharp X68000 over in Japan got lemmings. And if I had a mouse for that system, I would be happy to demonstrate it for you, but I don't, so here's the menu screen. Someone even made a version of lemmings for the Atari 800 in 1998, nearly 20 years after the platform was launched. There it was, you can now play lemmings on that too. In short, lemmings was everywhere. Except in your local arcade. Now, is that surprising that a game so popular didn't make it to the arcades? Well, not particularly, because when I think about Lemmings, I think about making a cup of tea and sitting down for an hour at least to work through the puzzles. It doesn't feel like an arcade game. And in 1991, when this game came out, Street Fighter 2 was the new kid on the block in the arcade, which was really giving the arcade a bit of life support because the golden era of arcade gaming of the 80s well, that truly was in its twilight years, and it took a few games like Street Fighter 2 to keep it alive before it waned as we moved further into the 90s. So it doesn't feel like an arcade game. However, I often ask this question to people who come and visit the cave. Have you played Lemmings 2 player? I know many of you out there will have, but I suspect many of you will answer in the same way as people do here. You can play two player Lemmings? They simply don't know that the feature exists, let alone having tried it, and it completely changes the dynamic of the game. It becomes a head-to-head -head competitive standoff between you and the other player, where you race to get your lemmings to the exit, but also you can sabotage your enemy. It really does change the game. So in that context, perhaps it could be an arcade game. Well, believe it or not, this idea was explored. It didn't reach release, but it did get quite far along in the prototype stage. And in this red case next to me is the only known surviving board from that development. Now, please feel free to correct me if you happen to have one hiding in a cupboard somewhere, but at this point in time, this appears to be the only known one in the world. So today, I would like to look this board over. I'd like to fire it up in a safe fashion with the help of the team here and see if it works, see what kind of condition it's in, and hopefully show you the game so we can see how it compares to the games that we're more familiar with in the Lemmings series. And before you start shouting, dump the ROMs, dump the ROMs down in the comment section. Don't worry, that was done some time ago. They are out there on the internet and you can even try it for yourself using the main emulator. So lots to look at today. And before we open this up and do that, we've got a guest with us today. It's Mike Daly from DMA Design, the the very man who signed my copy of Lemmings and part of the original DMA team that created Lemmings. And I thought I'd call him up just to see, even though they weren't involved in the development of this, how it came into being and if he has any insight at all into its history. Let's see what Mike has to say. 
And if you wanted to manufacture your own lemming, where would you go? Well, I'd go to PCBWay.com, Masters of CNC Milling, 3D Printing, PCB Manufacture, and more. As a sponsor, they're also a great help in keeping the channel and the museum running. So we thank PCBWay for their support, and you should go and check them out at PCBWay.com. Hi, my name is Mike Daly, and I was a co-director of design when we did Lemmings. Hi, Mike. Um, tell us about the idea for a Lemmings Arcade. Were you involved in that decision at all, or do you know how it came about? No, as far as I'm aware, um, the head of Data East at the time was just a huge Lemmings fan. Um, so he approached Psygnosis about doing one. Um, I don't know much more than that. Dave did say that he apparently wouldn't end some meetings without challenging people to a two-player game of Lemmings. <laughs> um, whether that's true or not, I don't know. But uh, I think it was the Data East approach diagnosis, but I don't know for sure. So how did the board come into your possession? <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a story. Um, so in 1999, um, I'd left DMA to go to Visual Sciences and... DMA st basically started to shut down at that point, 99 to 2000, um, and moved through to Edinburgh. And myself and a friend of mine, Mark Ettel, um, he managed to get permission from Les Benzies, who have, have run Rockstar North in Edinburgh, to basically go and ransack the offices for anything that was left <laughs> that we fancied. Um, so we kind of immediately headed into the old IT room and there was just stacks of discs and boards and all that kind of stuff. And that was sitting on a shelf. Um, so there's a few things there that I'm sorry I didn't get. I'm quite pleased I got the arcade board. I also did get the original Lemmings disc from there as well. Um, mm -hmm. There was a skip outside with a lot of dev stuff in it. I did clamber into a skip and rescue a 3DO dev kit. It's now wow. in the museum. So we did get lots of stuff from it, but it's like anything. If we went back now, I would just take a big truck and put it all in and then oh, yeah. sort it out later. So um, <laughs> we didn't have that long. We had about an hour just to go through and look through the offices and see what we fancied. Okay. So DMA Design didn't play any part in, in no, the development of this? No. We, I mean, the first we heard of it is when we got the board. Dave might have known about it beforehand, but then the board arrived um, and we all kind of crowded around to look at it. It would have been between uh, Lemmings 1 and Lemmings 2 time that it arrived. Mm -hmm. Um the only reason I know that is because the fast forward on the arcade game is where it came from in Lemmings 2. We thought, oh, that's a good idea. We'll have that. <laughs> we'll have that. That was the inspiration. So how yeah. complete was the arcade board when you got it to look at? Um, um, it was still a bit wire mod city. and You know, it's, it was still mm. a prototype board. The game mostly seemed to be up and running. Um, we were able to play through a few levels. We didn't play all the way through. So don't know how complete it is. Uh, mm -hmm. There were some obvious bugs in it. Um, you could build up to the top of a level and then walk a lemming right along the top of a level and then drop down the bottom, which we thought was quite funny. Um, but aside from that, I mean, it was it was interesting to see. Um, when we got it, it was a board and two trackballs. We never hooked up the trackballs. Um, we did have a jammer, a couple of jam arcade machines, so we put it in and just played with a joystick. Um, mm -hmm. So. We never really experienced it with the trackball at all. I mean, it, as a coder, we were jealous of the hardware that they would have to just throw lemmings about. It wouldn't slow down, you know, as it, they'll have mm -hmm. hardware sprites for doing everything. Um, but the rest of it just seemed to be that the game kind of regurgitated onto an arcade machine. Um, I'm not quite sure how they were going to do, um, you know, the, get the, them pumping coins in. Uh, they hadn't quite got to that other than the timer. You fail, you, you lose. Uh, I don't know if they had any other plans for it. Here is our board. It's a Data East branded board and it has the part number DE03570. Now I can't see that it's been used for any other game, but the numbering would find a place around about Robocop 2, Caveman Ninja, and then the next board 358 is a game called Wizard Fire. And these all originate from 1991 and 92. So it sits around about there. It's based around a Motorola 68000 CPU and it's got a 6809 supporting it. There's also a lot of glue logic. Hot glue, get it? 
Ah, yes, the unavoidable first impression of this board is glue and bodge wires everywhere. These green wires here, for example, lead to a nest of resistors and capacitors on the edge connector. There's more bodge wires on the back. And all in all, this gives us an indication as to how close this was or wasn't from being a finished product. There are 16 ROMs spread across the board storing the game. It's a combination of 64 and 128K EPROMs, which amount to 1.56 megabytes. So that's just over one high density floppy disk. Now it would be careless to just plug it in and see if it works. So Holly and I did some basic visual and continuity checks. For those of you who haven't met Holly before, she really helps out in the arcade as our main tech down there. Starting with the jammer connector, we needed to make sure that there are no obvious dead shorts, that there are no visual signs that it's been fried by a power supply in the past, and just check all over the basics. The same applied to checking the various chips on the board. For example, our 6809 is an EP variant. That's got an external rather than internal clock. And Holly is checking those lines for continuity, checking ground, checking five volt lines aren't broken. And all in all, everything seems fine. We're pretty satisfied. So we're going to hook up our super gun. The super gun is basically an arcade cabinet on a board, which will give it power and it will give us back RGB SCART output for video. It will take input from our Neo Geo joysticks and um, well allow us to test it out. So I've just popped a bit of card under the PCB to make sure it's not any kind of conductive surface under it. And then it's time to flick the power switch and see what happens. And it comes to life. It's our first sight of the prototype in action. What you're watching here, I've sped up 1500%. This is an attractor loop, which is over six minutes long and it explains how to play the game. Now a credit is three minutes of play. And I think that's very telling. Six minutes of guidance for a three minute game. That does not scream arcade to me. When that finally finishes, it takes us back to the intro screen, which is similar to the home version in that you have lemmings in a hot air balloon, but a little bit fancier in its presentation. And there are graphical glitches if you look closely. You can see there are lines through various sprites. So that's not quite right. I also love that license is spelled wrong. Under license from Psygnosis. The graphical glitches that we see are not present in MAME, so that would suggest that it's a hardware issue rather than the ROMs themselves. They've been dumped, they're the ones we're playing in MAME and the graphics are fine. Once into the game, I have a choice of 56 levels and 11 additional mystery levels, which I guess have to be unlocked. The levels are familiar, but they're in a different order sometimes to those that we know on the home versions. Once in game, it's all very familiar. The graphics are as good as any version I've played, and you would expect that of an arcade. A nice additional touch is the Lemmings voices, which guide you. But what's noticeably absent is a percentage of saved Lemmings. Instead of having to save 50% of them to progress, for example, only one Lemming needs saving, and then you can go to the next level. And that really does change the game. More often than not, I would just abandon the rest of the Lemmings and guide one little lemming all the way to the end just to get to the next level. Also new is a fast forward and pause button. That speeds the lemmings through the levels, but it also speeds up the clock counting down at the bottom of the screen. Now Mike mentioned that they incorporated this feature in Lemmings 2, having seen it on the arcade. You will also find it on the 3DO and the Atari Lynx versions of Lemmings, and I really like it. It may well be on other versions, but those are the two I've seen it on. It works well. In the game, as in life, time certainly doesn't seem fair. However much you have left, it rolls onto the next level and you do get a time bonus, but only once per credit. So when you put a credit in, if you complete the level, you get extra time for that first level that you finish and then nothing after that. So there's no reward for completing further levels. Time just runs out and you have to put more money in. This means that no matter how skilled you are, you will run out of time, and that's going to turn players right off. I know it does me, there is no reward for skill. There's also a fun bug that lets you go off the top of the screen, like this. So this could give you some new ways of approaching a level just to skip everything and walk along to the end. Uh, but I did struggle to take advantage of it in some other levels, such as here, where I simply ended up with a ramp for all of my lemmings to dive off to their deaths. Speaking of death, one of the most satisfying parts of the game is watching a lemming pop 
and the little particles that fly out of them. But we're denied that on the arcade. They do pop, but there's no shower of lemming flesh to be seen. Shame. And when you compare the arcades side by side with the Amiga original, there's not a great deal in it if I'm honest. The presentation is very similar, the arcade nearly looks identical to the home system, it doesn't really elevate it to the next level. And while I did, and I always will extol the virtues of two player lemmings, and I did have fun playing it here with Holly, it didn't make the arcade. It didn't elevate it to a level where I'd think, if I walked into an arcade back in the day, I would put my cash in this instead of Sunset Riders, WWF WrestleFest, Mortal Kombat, I don't know, what else did I play? Lethal Enforcers, all of those great quick arcade blasts. The Lemmings Arcade, oh, it doesn't really feel like it belongs there. Perhaps in the corner of a quiet social club to be enjoyed. Perhaps in a museum. I wonder what Mike thinks. So given that this is your board and we've established that it's in a working state, bugs and all, what would you ideally like to see happen with this board, Mike? It'd be nice to get it in a, a, an actual cabinet and mm -hmm. stick it in an arcade so people can play it because nobody ever had that experience. Um, okay. It would be nice for just to sit there and see what people think of it because it's been in these kind of Pandora boxes and stuff and they're all joystick. It's not the right experience. So, you know, a couple of trackballs and, and see what people think of it. So a trackball's a must for you. Yeah, so thanks. Probably so. enjoy this. Okay, yeah. we'll keep that in mind. And have you ever come across, or do you know if there's any sketches of cabinet designs, marquees, no, anything like that? We no. only ever got the board. I never, I can't remember seeing anything else about it. Um, yeah, no, nothing. <laughs> okay, and what's your preference, stand up or cocktail cabinet? Oh, stand up. Stand up cabinet. Yeah. Okay, especially okay. for a two player, it has to be stand up. Shoulder to shoulder, yeah. yeah. Okay, right, leave that with us, Mike. Thank you for your time today, and we'll see what we can do. Good. <laughs> so there it is, that is the Lemmings prototype. I'm so glad that it's working. Yes, there are some artifacts and odd problems. It's hardly surprising when you look at the number of bodge wires on there. It is a prototype, and we will look into that and see if there's a way that we can fix that, or if it's just the way the board was designed, if they never got that far. Um, who knows? We'll look into it. And if we can fix it, we will. And I think, uh, in line with Mike's wishes, it would be wonderful to make a dedicated Lemmings Arcade cab. An upright one with trackballs. Again, if the prototype got as far as properly supporting trackballs, otherwise it would be joysticks, but trackballs would be the dream, a couple of trackballs. Um, and those of you who have perhaps watched the computer space um, replica that we've created recently using 3D printers, maybe we could lean into some of that. Maybe we could have a traditional arcade cabinet, but we could have some 3D printed relief to uh, build out the shape of a lemon or a lemon's umbrella or something like that. I really want this to look like a fairly unique standalone arcade cabinet for lemons in keeping with Data East cabinets of the period. So we'll try and find that balance. And then truly it would be a museum piece. Do we let people try it out on the real hardware? Do we frame it and display it next to it? I mean, it would be great if it was in the cabinet itself, but it would be also be great if you could switch between all the different versions of Lemmings and try them out on the cab. Maybe that's reaching and being a bit too ambitious. Maybe we just stick with the board. The important thing for now is that it's in safe hands and it's working. And also if anyone has any information whatsoever or contacts for the developers of this, TTR Developments, I would love to talk to someone. I would love to hear their side of the story about the development of this board. So please, if anyone has any contacts at all, let me know and we can make a tremendous part two where we create the cabinet and we find out even more about the history of this uh, little before scene arcade board. Thank you as always for taking the time to watch. If you would like to come to the cave or the arcade archive and check out what we do here, go to retrocollective.co.uk where you can book tickets, you can browse our shops, our gift shops, you can look at the wonderful retro electronics products that Heber make uh, and buy yourself some of those. All sorts to be found at retrocollective.co.uk and hopefully I will see you here in the near future. Thank you, take care and I'll see you next time. Bye bye.